Hi, I'm Will Morris, PwC's Global Tax Policy Leader. Two months ago, we launched phase one of our new Global Tax Talk initiative. This is a new way of delivering to you the tax you need to know in the way that you want to receive it and in the time frame that you have. Every week, I give you a look forward into the tax policy issues that will dominate the coming week in around 60 seconds. Today, we're launching phases two and three of Global Tax Talk. First, in phase two, monthly for the moment, We'll have a 10-minute episode diving into a couple of tax stories in a little more depth. However, while these will go deeper, we'll avoid using jargon, we'll use straightforward language, and the episodes are designed to be consumed on the go. And phase three will be a series of occasional five-minute interviews with PwC leaders and others on key issues businesses in their sector are seeing. To kick off, we've wrapped a great segment on risk into this episode. So thanks for tuning in, and please do keep coming back so that you stay global tax ready. Welcome to the November edition of Global Tax Talk. I am Ege Berber. We have a lot to cover in this episode, including a conversation between Will Morris, PwC's Global Tax Policy Leader, and Dr. Astrid Bauer, PwC's Global Tax Risk and Quality Leader, about risk, AI, and much more. But first, we begin with Pillars 1 and 2. Speculation continues about Pillar 1 following the release last month of the Amount A Multilateral Convention, which relates to the redistribution of certain taxing rights to market jurisdictions. The OECD has held webinars and even published new fact sheets, yet a number of open issues in the draft remain. We expect the timing origin laid out by the OECD, consensus and signature by the end of the year is likely not going to happen. One reason is that U.S. Treasury Secretary Yellen has signaled a delay due to open issues and a desire to hear more from the U.S. business community. The U.S. 60-day consultation continues until mid-December. And as a side note, last week, Finland became the second country to have opened formal consultations. Some countries, however, are not waiting for consensus on Pillar 1 issues. Canada plans to enact a new digital services tax. In contrast to other countries, Canada did not promise to abstain from unilateral action to expand its taxing powers on digital. The OECD's Pillar 2 initiative, on the other hand, is proceeding with greater certainty. Pillar 2 aims to impose a global minimum tax on multinational inter-enterprises with profits subject to an effective tax rate lower than 15%. A number of countries have introduced or updated global minimum tax legislation within the past month. France, Malaysia, Austria, Romania, Hungary and Lithuania have issued draft laws, although Lithuania has opted to defer the application of the rules for six years. Countries like Japan, Netherlands, Ireland, Cyprus and Qatar have either issued amendments or guidance or advanced their legislation. Other jurisdictions are in the early phases of implementation. For example, Kuwait is considering an overhaul of its tax laws and Puerto Rico's Treasury Secretary is seeking taxpayer input. Poland, Barbados, and Bermuda are in a similar stage. In fact, Pillar 2 is generating significant complexity. Heavy compliance burdens are expected to follow for larger multinational enterprises. The global tax landscape is also causing uncertainty, and with uncertainty comes risk. Let's now listen to a recent interview with Dr. Astrid Bauer as she describes what she's seeing across the globe. Welcome to Global Tax Talk. I'm Will Morris. There's undoubtedly a list, which seems to be increasing by the day, of issues keeping business tax folks and others up at night. To understand some of those issues from a slightly different perspective, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Astrid Bauer, who is PwC's Global TLS Risk and Quality Leader and my new best friend. Astrid, welcome to the show. Thank you, Will. I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you. So Astrid, your role is currently focused on risk and quality. What, in your opinion, are the risk factors facing companies and how are they different in different parts of the globe? Well, Will, that's a very big question. (laughs) 
I would say uh, risk is very often dependent on mentality, on the framework that you're operating in. And so inevitably in different parts of the world, there is a different risk appetite. So this is something that I see, but I also see commonalities, namely that uh, laws take longer and longer to come into play. And of course, once they're there, they are made for a long time, whereas everyday questions change very rapidly. So this means that also the risk operation is different on a day-to-day -day basis than just being compliant uh, with regard to the legal framework. This is something I see very much evolving. Right. And um, you know, just a follow-on question from that. Do you see businesses paying more and more attention to risk and quality? Or uh, you know, there are some who uh, just take the option of trying to stick their head in the sand. I mean, how do you, again, obviously it differs around the world as well. What are you, what are you seeing in that, in that in relation to that? Well, they better do take attention. <laughs> so, uh, yes, they do. They, um, I, I mean, um, for all credit, companies have always been uh, pretty careful, as much as I can right. judge, around the world. Uh, they are always outliers, but in general, very careful about right. risk and quality. Good. But uh, it's getting a more and more important um, uh, standpoint in the uh, in the territories, just because the the field for risk and quality is wider and wider. Right. And so we need more and more specialists to actually deal with those matters. Great. Thanks. So um, I'd like to now move on to, uh, to, to get your thoughts on compliance. Now, obviously, this is clearly a subset of, of risk and quality. Uh, and I'm speaking to you during a week when the OECD um, has produced a mountain of documents. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, companies, uh, even apart from that, are grappling with vastly increased reporting, but also increased transparency. Um, could you talk about what you see and hear from your counterparts and clients? Um, what does compliance look like today for a global company? It uh, it looks like being more on the transparent side than ever before. Mm. Um, I personally, I live in Germany, which is a country that has data protection laws all over the place, uh, privacy concerns all over the place. I'm personally a very private person. And years ago, I would have said there's nothing about this. But with the continuous demand towards everybody to be more transparent, this is extremely what uh, companies have to deal mm. with to find their way into it and also you know mistakes they may make get public mistakes so this is something that they really have to focus on and very many companies uh, have started to say this is so complicated and so demanding well we outsource certain of our obligations to those who know better than we right so how do you see the um, the level of reporting compliance that we've just been talking about essentially changing the way the trajectory if you will uh, of how companies operate globally. Is it having an effect on that? Yes, I think it has. Mm -hmm. If you always have in the back of your mind that people will know what you do and people all over the world, and also technology nowadays is much broader than we ever had like 20 years ago, 30, right. 40 years ago. So what you do will be inevitably in the public domain. So this affects, of course, companies and, uh, and many have started changing already. And those who still think it's just a trend that will go over, right. I guess they will start very soon. They'll find out to be sure. Okay, so one, one final question uh, on everybody's mind right at the moment um, uh, is artificial intelligence, uh, AI. Um, how are you seeing the impact of AI on companies? Again, as, a, as an R&Q issue, as a risk and quality issue, um, and perhaps even more broadly than that. Yeah. Well, there will be an issue and there will be there will be an effect, of course. You know, when I think back, the telephone had an effect, the car had an effect, the iPhone had an effect. And AI, I believe, is here to stay. So it will have an effect on how do I do things? How do I train my people? Uh, how can I trust technology? So at the moment, I guess we are still in a phase in which many companies are still at awe and say, well, I don't quite know how to deal with matters. But but we will probably have to move very fast. Right. This is what we do as well. Um, and, and so it's here to stay. And we, uh, I believe, have to find the right business cases to start to use this appropriately. So to, um, to, to skill up our people in an appropriate way, but also to make sure that they don't feel AI will take their places. Mm -hmm. There is a way for and, and a place for everybody of us. And it is for us now to find. Good. That's great. 
So Astrid, thank you so much for joining us. We'll look forward to getting you back again, I hope. And thank you all for watching Global Tax Talk. Tune in every week so you can be global tax ready. Thanks to Will and Astrid for their insightful comments. Indeed, C-suits have their hands full these days, and a rising trend is transparency, and specifically sustainability reporting. The October 1st deadline for the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism is another milestone for this rapidly expanding area of reporting. The mechanism's transitional phase entered into force on that date for certain products. The Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, aims to put an appropriate price on the carbon emitted during the production of carbon-intensive goods that are entering the EU and to encourage cleaner industry production in non-EU countries. This analysis is based on important content and what so-called green taxes and incentives have applied along the way. Given the recent proliferation of both carrots and sticks around the globe, tax can be a key component of this sustainability measure. Both green taxes and green incentives levied by governments to reach their own environmental targets. Tax can also be a critical part of broader environmental social governance reporting, or ESG for short. This is a topic we plan to talk about in more detail in a future episode. While green credit and incentives continue to expand globally, so do other incentives aimed at attracting foreign investment and certain global business within a country's borders. Recent examples include China's increased super deduction ratio of R&D expenses for certain industries, South Korea's creation of opportunity zones with tax incentives for investors, Mexico's new depreciation incentives for certain manufacturers located there, a new qualified job credit and R&D credit in Barbados, and a pledge from Indonesia to continue offering tax breaks to attract foreign investors until the global minimum tax is actually implemented. We are seeing companies closely monitor this area to identify any potential application of these incentives and whether they change over time, given the shifting global tax policy environment, specifically whether they qualify as a so-called qualified refundable tax credit under Pillar 2 rules. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Global Tax Talk. We'll be back in December, but be sure to tune in to Will Morris every Friday for 60 seconds on key global tax policy insights for the coming week. Links to recent episodes are included in the description of this episode. Thanks for tuning in and come back next time so you stay global tax ready.